President Ames, DLSTS past presidents, executive board members, our well wisher Sri Jain Shah, the vibrant publications Sri Deep Pudeshji, deans, directors, esteemed faculty members, other participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you and a great morning to Professor Jagadish Tetji. Before the session starts, I request Professor Dr. Vaday Salvin K, who is the group director of SP Mandali's principal Ellen Wellington Institute of Management, Development and Research, known as V School. Professor Vaday Salvin K is the illustrious past president of AIMS during 2007 2008. Now, I request Professor Dr. Vaday Salvin K to offer his opening remarks. Dr. Sheikh, sir, good evening. Good you evening. Look, absolutely, you look stunning, fresh, <laughs> and fine as, as usual. It's it's wonderful. So, author of the book, Professor Dr. Dilly Sheikh, sir, Charles Sage, guest star professor of marketing at Emory University. He's my mentor, but also he's a guru mentor for many of us uh, in India. And, and it's, it's wonderful to see his passion about nation building. And now through this, this book title, India's Room to Transformation, Why Leadership Matters, this fireside chat, definitely we're going to have with him, Professor Vijay, and uh, we'll follow actually condolence for late Professor Gananda Singh, who's a former PNG executive and associate with Kellogg School of Management, Northwest University. So ladies and gentlemen, my request, uh, if you can follow a minute of silence for him, Thank you very much. Uh, and so our, in fact, President Ames, Dilip Sharma ji is not on this platform because he's in the rural part of uh, India and he was finding problem with the connectivity. So that's why he just uh, suggested me that if I can uh, brief about the Ames to our members who are present here on the Zoom link as well as on YouTube. Uh, also, I acknowledge the presence of Jain Bhai. Jain Shah has been very instrumental to make it happen along with uh, Dr. Jagdi Sahib, sir. And also Deep Udeshi, publishers of Vibrant uh, kind of Publishing House. The fellow directors, deans, our past presidents, board members, colleagues, and students from various member institutions. This is, this is a wonderful moment. And I'm sure through this fireside chat will add a tremendous, uh, I'd say, wealth of knowledge from Dr. Sheikh, sir, and this book uh, talking about definitely nation building, India's future, power of vision, the transformational leadership, and in terms of uh, leadership point of view, what precedes uh, others, be it social, be it economical, be it political, and how probably many countries across the globe have showcased that kind of leadership and sharing with you the nuances, I'm sure in a very interesting manner. But the crux or essence is why leadership matter. So when we all are working out in terms of institutional leadership, our own domain, or maybe from AIMS point of view in our regions or national level, but this topic, I'm sure the pulse of wisdom, which will be shared by Professor Dr. Jagdish Shaikh, sir, will be of immense help in the long-term point of view. But prior to that, uh, I just wish to mention about AIMS to our members and some of our young a kind of faculties and even uh, students who are present here. And uh, AIMS was founded in 1888. The Association of Indian Management School is one of the largest associations of the business schools in the world. AIMS is working for the advancement of management education in the country through various means. AIMS assists member institutions in policy advocacy, and which was witnessed in recent uh, kind of, you know, annual process handbook of AI City as well. AIMS presidents, AIMS past presidents, uh, like Nanda Gopalji, and many other past presidents, advocacy board members, 
has shown that, that time and again, AIMS is of great help. Accreditation point of view, research point of view, market development programs point of view. AIMS takes its pride in having nearly almost 800 top class institutions like IAMS, ISPs, ASCII, Xavier Institutions, BIMTEC, Welling Institute Management, V School, NMIMS, Jagan Bajaj, IFI, MDI, SPGN, and many management departments of universities as its members. It is one of the largest networking bodies of business schools in the world. Moreover, it is the official representative of Indian management schools in India, as well as some important international forum. So I'm sure the AIMS will be immensely benefited, Dr. Sheikh, sir, with your presence. And uh, I'm going to request now Prasad to take it over. And uh, thanks, Vijay, sir, for commenting this fireside chat. And I'm sure it will be very interesting for us. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Professor Uday Salinkaji, for your uh, brief and uh, uh, opening remarks about the AIMS and also your association with Professor Gregory Sheikh, sir. I am very happy that uh, also it is my privilege to introduce the speaker of the day, Professor Jagdish N. Sheikh, sir. Professor Jagdish Sheikh is Charles H. Kalstad, Professor of Business, Voyage Business School, Emory University, USA. He is globally known for his scholarly contributions in consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strategy, and geopolitical analysis. Over 50 years of experience in teaching and research at University of Southern California, University of Illinois, at Urbana Champion, Columbia University, MIT, and Emory. Dr. Sheth is a recipient of the 2020 Padma Bhushan Award for Literature and Education, one of the highest civilian awards given by the government of India. He is a fellow of various professional bodies such as the Academy of uh, International Business, the Association of Consumer Research, the American Psychological Association, and the American Marketing Association. He is a distinguished fellow of the Academy of Marketing Science and International Engineering Consortium. He is the recipient of all four top awards given by the American Marketing Association, AMA. Additionally, he received the Global Innovation Award and Marion Crickmore Award, both from Emory University. Dr. Sheikh has been advisor to numerous corporations all over the world. He has authored and co-authored more than 350 papers and numerous books. He is the founder of Center for Telecommunications Management at the University of Southern California, founder and chairman of India, China, and America, ICA Institute, which analyzes the trilateral relationship and its impact on geopolitics, security, trade, investment, and the founder and chairman of the Academy of Indian Marketing, which supports the research and scholarship among Indian scholars in marketing and management. Amazing, sir, to have you on this occasion. Thank you. I also am happy to introduce the lead discussant who is going to be in conversation with Professor Jagdish and Seth, sir. Professor Vijayan Pankajakshan. He is a Dean HR, Chief Human Resource Officer and Head Career Management Cell, V School, Mumbai. And he is a gold medalist in MA, uh, PM and IR from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. 1982-84 batch. Professor Vision has been associated with V School for the last 14 plus years. Prior to joining V School, he was with several corporates for more than 25 years. His professional affiliations include SHRMSCP, HRCIGPHR, EFI Core Group Member, and National HRD Network Life Member and immediate past presidents of uh, NHRD and Mumbai Charter. I now hand over the proceedings to Vijayan sir. Thank you, Dr. Prasad, and uh, welcome once again to Dr. Professor Jagdish Sheth, sir. Uh, it's a lifetime opportunity for me, uh, and I'm going to remember this all my life. And uh, the design of today's chat with your permission, sir, is that uh, we'll have our conversations on based on questions till about 8.15. 
uh, and then I think the audience would be ready uh, and they are already sending their questions on the chat box. So is that structure all right, sir? Oh, absolutely, yes. Okay. So that's, I think, a very obvious uh, uh, question that, uh, especially with your marketing and general management and strategy background, what really made you write a book, which to some people will say it's an HR or a, you know, something else. So it must be a fascinating reason how you decided to conceptualize this book. Yeah. There are two reasons. One, of course, is that I studied myself behavioral sciences. My PhD was in behavioral sciences. My applied field was marketing, but my outside field was social psychology. I really wanted to study motivation. What motivates people? That was my main reason. I would have gone into management, but instead I went into marketing, more understanding psychology of customers. So that's the foundation. What makes people do what they do kind of notion. The other one is more recent. In late 80s, early 90s, I began to get involved with policy, governments, starting with government of Singapore. That led me into geopolitics. And I wrote two books. First one, still my favorite, is called Tectonic Shift, Rise of the Emerging Economies. And I was doing research and giving speeches from about 1990s, roughly. And I wrote the book eventually, suggesting what are the issues that will arise with the rise of emerging economies, especially gaining more market share for the global GDP. What are the sustainability challenges, for example, that will arise, environmental issues. Talked about that one. That was uh, followed by another book, which was maybe a little more recent, called Chindia Rising, Rise of China and India, very focused on those two nations and why that they are going to add additional $10 trillion to the economy with a ratio of uh, probably about one third India and two third China at that time, always changing dramatically. That's really the jealousies. And I became much stronger with India, watching India in the way progress was made, especially since 2014, with a new party coming in, with a new leader coming in actually, coming from a different state than UP altogether, either from South India or from Western India, bringing a new perspective in the process. And I think that change that I saw happening fascinated me. Gyani Singh, unfortunately, could not be with us anymore. He was also very passionate about the change taking place in India, especially since the 1991 economic reforms, the kinds of excitement that was created in India. And he was my former student. 1970, he studied MBA at University of Illinois. And we became good friends over time. We used to keep communicate. So in one of those conversations, he said, I read your book, Chindia Rising. I'm very passionate also, same thing. Can we do something together? which led to the start of this journey, which is amazing. A lot of research was done by Gyani. Gyani was so passionate. Basically, somebody who really was skeptical about India ever rising, and after going back to India in 1993 to 1995, he became an entrepreneur and a corporate executive. And that gave him really the motivation to do something. And we collaborated. The focus on leadership came in a very different way. There are lots of great books on economic perspectives, political perspectives about nations. But nobody really focused on leadership perspective. In other words, what makes a difference because of the individual involved, leader primarily, just like in a corporation. Since both of us come from a business discipline, that was very obvious to us that leadership matters, which is why we talked about more focusing on the leadership aspect as opposed to something else. That's the really beginning of the book. It was a okay. great journey. We yeah. began to write 2019 almost. It was a okay. great journey. Unfortunately, it's really my loss because he was a great colleague and he was so excited. And I'm so sorry we missed Gianni. So 
that was a labor of love between both of you. Unfortunately, Gyan was not is not there to share this uh, this joy. But uh, it's very interesting. Uh, audience would also find it that you the part of the trigger for this book came from earlier research that you've been doing, particularly focusing on China, India, emerging economies, and it, this probably was a maturation of for those thought processes. Uh, am I right, sir, if understanding it that way? Absolutely, exactly right. Okay. It basically comes, I shifted my interest from understanding psychology of customers, which is how I began my academic journey. Then I went into more competitive strategy, for example. And then I went to more macro issues, more economic rather than psychological perspectives, more policy oriented, which led me into geopolitics. It also led me to start an institute actually in 19, I think it's 2003, called India China America Institute. To me, there was a new triad power emerging. The old triad power used to be the 12 Western European countries, common market countries, America and North America and Canada, North America. And the late entrant was um, Japan. Right. It was a very brilliant uh, scholar. The book Kenichi Omai for the triad power. He articulated that the rise of Japan at that time. And I saw a shift in the power base rather than Japan, it'll be China, for example. Europe will be basically going to a different direction, and India will. It was a big surprise to everybody, including myself, to see the rise of India. And that was the key trigger point for me to get into understanding more focused area on India, pretty much. So that institute became a think tank. Okay. And that's how we began to talk about the new triad power. Right. And therefore, I hope to understand China and India at the same time, with a focus on India now. China right. has already gone through the journey. India is right. starting. So if I may go to the next question, sir. Uh, I think the book, you have compared India and China. And uh, obviously, you mentioned that even in a democracy like India, or maybe a little more totalitarian state like South Korea or China, uh, China, that it takes considerable time. And I think you use the uh, first time I've heard about it, the 2% reduction in GDP. So what I understand is that to get transformational change happening in a democracy like India is, is a little different from that of totalitarian state. But I, if we choose the democratic route which we have chosen, we might lose a little bit on the growth way. Uh, so if you could just share with our listeners on this aspect, please. What you need, if you take a democratic approach as we are doing it, is what I call a disciplined democracy. The disciplined democracy. Democracy without discipline is acrimony basically leads into more and more fragmentation. So you need to have somebody who is able to put a discipline at the same time using the democratic process. In the autocratic process, things can happen much faster as we saw in Singapore with Lee Kuan Yew, for example, as we saw with Deng Xiaoping in China, as we saw in Korea at the same time. But I think democracies have also shown that they can transform it's a little more messy just like parliamentary democracy, as opposed to republic democracy that we have in the US. So we have, we have case studies about the United States transforming under Abraham Lincoln at one time, and then FDR more recently, for example. We have examples of Germany transforming twice, same way. So many of these countries are democratic countries, but it takes a long time to get everybody on the same page, which is why you require leadership. Vijayan, it's nothing new. You know, being an HR professor, you know, this is what happens in a company when a new chairman or a managing director in, he has to make sure everybody is on the same page about where we are going. He has to do more. What you have to do is more internal marketing. Smartest leaders in the corporate world know their first job is not external marketing to the investors or even customers internal marketing to making sure that everybody understands what the game plan is all about, what the vision is all about, what the change is all about now that you have a new leadership. 
I think same thing is true at the national level. Sir, so, uh, uh, I think you alluded definitely that in the last 10 years under our current Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, uh, to a great extent has reduced some of the gaps, the bigger gaps with what India could have achieved and where it is now. So if you could uh, share one or two areas uh, where you feel this gap is reduced and maybe one or two challenges that the political leadership uh, or the citizen leadership of India still continues to be with. The two areas where the gap has been reduced significantly, one is technology, clearly. Nobody expected India to be so heavily involved in digital technology. The cell phone revolution, the mobile phone revolution, I think it's very, very key to the transformation of the nation as it has been in China, as it has been in other countries. <clears throat> so I think that's clearly one thing. The other one is much more globalization or global, uh, 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 you know, uh, aspiration or global visibility, really, right? right what is the global visibility? India today is highly visible all over the world compared to uh, what, what was recently the case. And not only that, but India is admired by the rest of the world more and more than ever before. I remember my younger days when I would travel all over Europe. And of course, coming from India, people thought India was a country of roaming cows and snake charmers. <laughs> so and, India a elephant, a and a few <laughs> elephants come on in for the community. <laughs> Exactly. Today, it's a country of talented people, technically competent. It's a wonderful country. In a democracy, it is able to change so nicely. Totally opposite view. To me, that's a remarkable transformation. So global visibility is another very key one. Whether it has come through our Indian diaspora, which is one explanation, and Indian diaspora has done very, very well. Whether it's in Gulf countries, for example, or in Southeast Asia, and of course in America, Canada, England, etc. I mean, it's remarkable to see how same education system that we criticize in some fashion actually generated world-class leaders, not just in the corporate leader, as we can see across industries beyond technology now, but also in the academic world. Any areas, uh, sir, uh, where possibly in spite of good efforts, we, there is still a gap which you are not comfortable with uh, in terms of work in process. I think there are two areas, maybe three. The first one is infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. For the size of the country and the economy, we just don't have enough ports. We don't have enough airports, for example. The connectivity is still not there except mobile phones. We need more physical infrastructure, clearly. And that's clear to me that gap has to be done quickly. Unfortunately, physical assets are longer takes time to build, longer times to maintain, et cetera. But one has to invest aggressively in infrastructure. How will we do it? But the second one is surprisingly to me is the agricultural sector. Even though it is declining in air, is still a very important sector. And agriculture, how can you make agriculture smart? And that will require land reforms, labor reforms, etc. Not just in the factories, but I think agriculture is key one. More and more, we need to do, as many people have articulated, value add in India. Selling commodities is not enough. Rice, for example, wheat at one time, for example. Of course, we are talking about uh, millets right now, we're in a big way, you know, pulses, etc. whatever it turns out to be, I mean, it just goes on. I think we really need to think about how can we make more additional value added, more ready to serve, ready to consume products. It is happening in the Indian diaspora market. If I go to my own stores here, to the restaurants, or typical grocery stores for Indians, we see all of the branded packaged products coming from India, pretty much with value that snacks, you know, meat pie, whatever they are. But it has to be done on a larger scale with the global market. The third area, which is happening, but 
government policy can actually create more pushes, how do we become the service capital of the world? Well, in IT services, we have done very, very well in 30 years from nothing to $150 billion industry, but there are many more pockets of those. It may be the legal services, for example, accounting services, for example, any of the certified professional services are very key to nurture, such as teachers, nurses, whatever they are, massively investing to create more capacity, but making them as globally oriented so they can be exported rather than just in technology, it is global anyhow by definition because of software, hardware. But in other cases, you may have to make sure that our teachers are very good ambassadors worldwide. They go and teach like a mission, for example, and then, 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 then they, they, are under, they go through the accreditation for foreign countries primarily, and they're guest workers there for a few years. Huge potential in professional services area. So India can aspire to become a service capital with government giving incentives to do it or giving a policy that is easy to do business with. So, uh, sir, actually you made a uh, very uh, major point while for many years we've been discussing should we go down the service route, you know, we should move away from agriculture. But I think the message that you're giving is both sectors need to develop global scale value addition and uh, increase their uh, increase their attractiveness even beyond India. Would that be true? So oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think you have to have a diversification of the nation. Depending on one sector alone, makes you more vulnerable because manufacturing today we may have it in India like China already is a manufacturing capital, but they did not do enough on the other two sides. So today it depends for agriculture on foreign countries or they're buying land in Africa, buying land someplace to cultivate their own food security. So food security has become a key issue in China. So they did not put the emphasis on it. I mean, they had the agricultural cooperatives where then shopping began the reforms primarily by privatizing it or allowing them to sit in the open market. But they have not put as much emphasis as they did on manufacturing. So uh, just to tell the viewers who are uh, connected and online, uh, do send your questions. Uh, it will be received in the chat box and uh, we will sort of pose it to someone uh, around 8.15 or so, maybe a little earlier too. So, the, uh, to yeah. Uh, so, right now, research independent of this book, I was very much fascinated that many, very often a manufacturing driven economy generates services. If yeah. you have an automotive center, for example, then financing, repair, maintenance, etc. Yeah. Right. Manufacturing creates services. But now, another paradigm that's emerging is that if you are a services economy, it creates manufacturing, for yeah. example. Yeah. In health, hospitality, tourism, when you are those industries, you need furniture, you need beds. You need the medical devices, just goes on. That's a very different manufacturing than the industrialized thinking of manufacturing. The manufacturing comes here, which is service driven manufacturing, which is an interesting paradigm. I'm very fascinated by that. And I'm trying to research and understand and conceptualize that what if there's an economy where yeah. it's a service manufacturing as opposed to manufacturing to one services. This is uh, out, out of, uh, this is something which I never thought of, sir. But I think it's fantastic. I, I think uh, if you had one golden takeaway so far, sir, <laughs> you already uh, shared many, but this is too good. We need, we need uh, many weeks and months to think about this. Uh, so going to, uh, sir, you mentioned briefly about Singapore and uh, I made a few visits to Singapore. And definitely I could relate to, but a little bit of a, you know, paradox where you feel the leadership style or the political leadership there is not maybe as, let's say, democratic like India. And yet that country has uh, developed its own persona in the world and uh, it attracts good talent, their GDP is growing. So a little bit of how are they managing this? How much to be open, how much to be disciplined for one of the better. As I mentioned, uh, 
democracy is a great institution. Democracy and capitalism are really two major institutions at the policy level. And to bring about a change in people, which is what Lee Kuan Yew tried to do, because Chinese had a very traditional society in the way they were behaving, how to make it more contemporary. And change is hard. There's more resistance to change than acceptance of change or innovation, for example. And to make it a more modern state in a very fast way, he had no choice but to say, we cannot have debates after debates after debates. We need to get on the page. There is a sense of urgency. There's a sense of survival even in, that, in the case of Singapore. As you know, Singapore was a part of the four associations at one time, but then Malaysia, that group kicked them out, became on their own. Now here is an island which is nothing. There is no industrial raw material that you can do manufacturing. Very bad. People have outpriced themselves. At, you know, the labor is not that cheap anymore. Yeah. And there's no the time, two and a half million people essentially. So you have to think very fast to say, how do I just survive? And when survival comes into the play, begin to say how to manage both ways. Basically, what we use the word is a tough love. Okay. Military does that thing. Military puts a discipline, even though they believe we, we can get more out of you, more potential. So that's what he had to do. Okay. I think it's necessary more and more okay. in most countries. So I think tough love is, I think, a good uh, uh, position, uh, some sort of a theme uh, around how some of these countries, like Singapore, maybe South Korea also, sir, to some extent. South or Korea in the beginning, exactly right. South Korea in the beginning. Both of them have very interesting uh, procedures, which I think is appropriate for India to think. In Singapore, surprisingly, despite what we think is a very free economy, very large sector is a public sector. Singapore Seaport Authority is a public enterprise. Singapore Airlines was a public enterprise. In fact, Singapore has a very large share of the economy driven by state enterprises, which I think we don't think about it. So was true in Korea, but in Korea rather than government enterprises, they use the chai balls as we call it, like, you know, uh, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, simply groups, business. And they used about nine, 10 chai balls to work together with the government. In other words, government policy about everything, export-oriented policy, and the company policy will be in alignment with each other, but they'll go in their own way. So that included Honda, for example, uh, Fashion, and uh, Tesco, which is a steel company, for example. Uh, you had the, of course, Samsung, uh, LG. I mean, those are the typical names you can see. A motivating, very similar to following the Japan model after World War. Okay. The government, the Zaibas, they, they, they call them, and then, then the government were in partnership to go in the same direction. Right. So you can have either private sector do that with you, or you can have invest in state enterprises on the same vision and the policy which is starting usually export-oriented. Yeah. So there are a few more questions before we we'll uh, redirect uh, audience questions to you, sir. Uh, I think uh, always a challenge in a globally linked uh, context, which seems to be also a necessary requirement of nations. Uh, could you uh, throw a little bit of light as to how our current prime minister has uh, strengthened and embedded a sort of a national character sitting alongside global relationships. Uh, uh, I think you mentioned uh, the, somewhere in the book, and that seemed quite interesting for our viewers also. It's really remarkable to see how highly respected, admired, and loved this prime minister is by different nations and different personalities. So you have the Putin in Russia, you may have the uh, Macron in France, very different personality. And then you have the, you know, the British prime minister who is now Indian, but before that only one. And then you see three presidents with very different personalities. 
which is primarily Obama in our case, followed by Trump and now Biden. And if you informal word is that they all like him. He rises above individual personalities in a way he bonds very well. That that nature of him to have a personal relationship, not just professional official visit is very important. Ultimately, you can pick up the phone and you can call and they will give an answer immediately. I think that's really one major characteristic. I've never seen a better brand ambassador for a nation uh, than, 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 than Prime Minister Modi. Think about how he has done well with the United Nations by having the International Yoga Day. Yeah. Whole world practices. Taking our ancient wisdom, putting into the contemporary context, which I think is very important. And that's what he's doing. Right now, he's in the UAE, as you know, right now, there's a live thing going on. And again, think about a country for different faith, totally allowing a temple to be built there. Yeah. It's a Baptist temple, BAPS temple, for example. Magnificent temple. All Baptist temples are very good. I think having that thing to say, I can have my national identity. I don't have to westernize myself to be part of you. It's like a colony mindset, you know? So you're having less colony mindset, not allowing the colonial powers to basically say, we ruled you. Now we are on an equal footing. To me, that's very important. Let me tell you, the key consequence of this prime minister above all the things we do is primarily creating an enormous self-image, positive self-image among masses. People feel good about being Indian, as opposed to saying, let me get out of the hopelessness here, you know? giving hope. Uh, I think that's a very key change. I also believe that he has been able to articulate very well India's positions worldwide, internationally. Rather than being an ally to one nation, having a multipolar relationship, basically diversifying all the risks associated with one nation or one block by having multiple blocks in some fashion. So he's just, just very much liked people, my people, not just the Indian diaspora. I think he was the first one to realize Indian diaspora is a big asset. Before that one, there were brilliant Indian people all over the world, not just in the academic world or scientific world or the corporate world, but also in terms of business world. And he was the one who said this Indian diaspora is very valuable. They are the bridge between India and the nation in which they have settled. So I think that has been a very smart strategy also. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we have one or two more questions and uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, you can let me know. Sir, uh, I think uh, there's a little bit of discussion, uh, may not be very uh, prominent, but uh, why why, uh, how long is this uh, slight degree of mismatch between GDP growth and the Human Development Index? Uh, I understand that they are different, but uh, if you could say, how can we possibly bridge that gap a little quicker? There are two ways. Most of the HDI is low because we have a very strong historical culture in terms of family, family ecosystem itself. Uh, our culture itself has this very much ancient good culture, but it needs to be contemporized in some fashion. That can be done by education, informing people that behavior accepted at one time cannot be accepted. Remember these HDI measures are from a Western perspective. And therefore, how do we modernize ourselves, that's clearly one area. Most of them can come through just education and information. But many of our practices are really not as possible. They were good in that time, but we need to have essence of what we do is very important, but it has to be in a contemporary way, pretty much. I think that's clearly one area. If that does not work, then you have to have policy. What you can and cannot do, just to tell, let you know, you know, smoking is a classic example. People used to smoke. Yes. 
And one day the government decided, asking people not to smoke, educating them how smoking is harmful to you, it's creating all kinds of public nuisance, etc. But nobody was listening, so you pass a law. And the law now says people just can't smoke. Yeah. In the office, you don't smoke. In the public places, you don't smoke. In the airlines, you don't smoke. Trains, probably, you don't smoke. And it just goes on. So uh, that's the way it changes the culture in many ways. So some of our consumption habits have to change. Some of our family relationship habits have to change, for example. To me, that's the issue primarily. But it can be done. Thank you, sir, so much. Uh, maybe one of the last. Yeah, sir, go ahead, sir, please. Edward, this is something that I still am not so sure I know right. I'm trying to validate from what I've heard. I was shocked when I read the, someplace where somebody told me who are really knowledgeable that India, even today, 90% of work is contract work. Mm -hmm. Only 10% is a regular employment. Each day index will go up if you make more and more regular employment and the laws and the you know the employee welfare are all taken care of by the employer in many ways as opposed to mercy of the family in many ways. Uh, I think that's very key. So uh, India is changing dramatically. My view is that India is transforming because we are going from unbranded to branded consumption more and more. Young people all want branded atta, branded you know rice, branded snacks, everything branded, and they are not buying as much from the informal unorganized retailing, but they're buying more organized retailing now, more than modern retailing, and especially e-commerce has changed dramatically. To me, that will change much more the behavior to our HDI, surprisingly, because now we're going to manufacture by a company. Homemade products may become more specialty. I think that's very key. Branding puts enormous quality assurance, requires yeah. some assistance. And I think that will change HDI index without the government involvement, except the government encouraging more and more unbranded to branded, for example, by regulation, labeling, etc. Yeah. So uh, would it be right? I'm just trying to say uh, connect something which you said earlier. In a way, the dual focus which you had mentioned on agriculture and manufacturing, the movement towards branded products actually is connected to supply chain and agricultural practices, uh, you know, not being sold as a commodity, but as a value add. Would that be uh, the correct understanding, sir? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yes. And many of the, and our research is more fascinating, leadership research. We found that you can reform a nation in four or five years, but to transform truly, from where it is to where it needs to go, it takes 15 years. So we did historical research across so many uh, leaders, uh, across countries, small countries like Korea and Singapore, to large countries like China, America, Germany. Uh, we did that for England. And fascinating, same conclusion came about, that what you need is a political continuity of at least 15 years, what you need is a political stability during that continuity, no internal strifes of any kind, and what you need is a good leader, or what we call a pragmatic leader, which is very important. So pragmatic leadership, and the leadership is very key, and the leader has to be not only pragmatic, but has an execution skill, get things done through right. the political, through this democratic, democratic family. Even in out of countries, you do have to get a consensus of your leader, basically. You know, it's, it's not like public consensus, but consensus by your team members. It's just like a corporation. You have to have that. So, so, so to me, that's very really interesting. Having that leadership makes all the difference, ultimately. Uh, Dr. Shait, sir, there are some interesting questions. So with your permission, I'll read out the first question. Uh, this is from Professor R.C. Bhattacharya. He says, I'm, co I'm, I'm reading out the question. You are the father of the industrial buyer behavior model. My question is, between two Asian giants, China and India, 
who do you think has transformation leadership now? Who has done what? Who, uh, which, which of the countries is uh, uh, an example of transformational leadership, India and China? Uh, comparing them in our book, we found fascinating that if you did look at the delay, China began about 20, 30 years ahead of us in terms of transforming itself. And uh, what they did compared to what we have done, which is 20 years, our speed of change is faster, surprisingly. Not in terms of manufacturing side per se, but in general. We have been able to accomplish a lot more, which comes as a surprise because in democracy, you expect more muddling around, you know, it just goes on back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes you top of the party in the process. Populism yeah. is worldwide. This year, I'm told in 2024, there'll be 70 nations will be electing their new leaders. I mean, if you look at pre-COVID, I was amazed. Every place you have leaders coming who have no political experience, like uh, Ukraine, for example. When he was a standard comedian, now becomes a nation's leader. No party even, which is very unthinkable. So incumbency has a problem now, right now. It seems like people don't, don't like any government, no matter what government they are. And of course, it's, if it's an autocratic thing, you have a revolt. Right. Right. So to me, I think comparing the two is very different. Let me tell you the difference really arises from the power. China very much understood, like Japan, that the first thing to do is to make manufacturing for world-class companies and products. Chinese did not have their own enterprises from a marketing, branding, packaging, viewpoint, supply chain. They're primarily value-add labor country, having people work six days a week, like in dormitories. They come from rural population, come to the factories, most of the technology and the processes was given by Western countries. Americans outsourcing their garment business, for example, before it went to Bangladesh, uh, America making machineries. Go if you look at that the luxury brands, etc. All the quality assurances and the processes came from Western economies for their own interest because it was cheaper to manufacture than ship out. So the whole supply everything came, which is slightly different in many ways. Because not even the domestic market, China, which now has become big enough. Ours is slightly different. We already had a private sector. We already had, you know, a market in place. And ours is more like unbranded to branded consumption. But the which is why, and of course, we jumped from agriculture to services much quickly, as opposed to going through agriculture, uh, manufacturing, and then services. So it, in the process, we did not build the infrastructure. It's much more, the biggest weakness is lack of infrastructure. If you compare, if you go to China, which I've done several times, infrastructure immediately striking. It is more modern than America. America is aging infrastructure. They're trying to revitalize now. It's more modern than European infrastructure, whether it's railroads or whether it's airports, et cetera. It's just, so I think they had to invest in the infrastructure in order not for the domestic market, but for the export market. And our export market is much smaller relative to China, relative to Singapore, relative to UAE even, the country, small island country. So they have no choice. They have to depend more on export than the domestic market. So I think the two are very different, it's like apples and oranges. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sir. Uh... The next question is from Dr. Nitin Kulkarni, and he asks uh, your, your, your response to, what could be the major challenges of India, for India in 2047? I presume he's taken uh, a 20 year view in terms of geopolitical shift. There are basically two or maybe three challenges. The first challenge is going to be that you now have to take care of the world also, not just India. If you're a major global player, you have to participate in the world challenges. They become your challenges. I mean, we did an excellent job during COVID 
which is a global pandemic essentially taking care of us and the world. But there'll be more challenges like that. Conflicts are all over the world. Whether there's a conflict in the Middle East or West Asia, a conflict in Asia, they may arise. Never know. You cannot ignore and simply say, I want to remain isolation, which America tried to do, but eventually America got involved in World War I, also World War II. They had nothing to do with those wars. But because you are a major global player, really one challenge. Second challenge is going to be that anything that you expand globally as your economy, uh, through export, etc., you have to protect those assets. You have to have a very strong military base to protect your economic assets, economic interest. That's the second challenge. I think my own view is that what is needed in the world for countries like India is not the hard power of military side, which we need to protect ourselves, but not to sort of be bully in the world. But what we really have, we can do a good job is soft power. The soft power is more contemporary soft power. We do have the culture, the heritage, etc., wisdom, all of that has spirituality, but we also need more modern soft power, technology soft power. Soft power of Indian brands, highly admired worldwide, which is how Germany became top, Britain became top in India after the Industrial Revolution. Japan was a laughing stock at the World War II, but they invested in quality brands for global markets, not for the domestic market. South Korea followed the same way. Today, China, the same thing. They are both low quality, but high quality products. Can India put its quality standards, which are global standards, on its manufacturing and Indian made products are highly admired? That creates a soft power in the minds of people. I mean, America gets a soft power from uh, rock band people. Oh. <laughs> you know, for all the movie stars and rock band <laughs> Taylor Swift phenomenon, as we call it. You know, I think we need to do something like that. Where something from India is admired by the world from a branding marketing viewpoint. So there are new soft powers are arising, which we will need to learn. We need to learn how to create soft power. My own view is that best soft power is coming from our people. Our people are best, very good physicians. The non-white in America prefer an Indian physician over their own physicians. This is true in corporate world. We have shown we can work very hard and then uh, do something for the company. Uh, you see the leadership, academic world, you can see. I was very surprised recently somebody gave me statistics that in America, there are 250 institutions where head of the institution, either at the dean level Indian. or at the or the India, 250. 250. That's huge. Yes, huge. That's huge. I'm still validate that number because it comes from a very reliable source, but you never know. I'm trying to validate. But it makes sense when you think about it. So there are so many not as well-known top 10 universities. There are others where Indians have done very well. Yeah. Not only we have done very well as scientists, obviously. So during COVID in public health, Every, every 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 channel that came in, you saw the chief public health person was an Indian scientist. So, so to me, I think we have a soft power for diaspora. So we have to learn the theory of soft power more and more as we go to our 2047. Thank you, sir. Uh, so question, in fact, the two questions I'm just combining it uh, because it's from the same person, Richa Thakur. Question to you, sir, is, is transformational leadership situational? And the follow-up question is, how can transformational leadership be encouraged and formed in organizations? So I assume that the questioner is asking that the book is talking about political leadership and uh, probably it's a, it's, a, it's a reverse, I don't know what to say, uh, you know, the corporates need to learn from the political class. So that was two questions, uh, one A, one B. So. What do you think? The two are connected. I wrote a book called The Self-Destructive Habits of Good Companies. My original title was supposed to be Seven Bad Habits of Good Companies. 
<laughs> on good habit people, effective people, but publisher won't allow me to have the title. <laughs> that book has worked really well because it struck a chord. I identified the biggest issue with any institution, whether it's an academic institution or a corporation or a government, is that when the institution is unable or unwilling to change when the context has changed. They are in a denial stage. So my opening chapter in that book primarily talks about how Digital Corporation was a world-class company. Ken Olson was a founder, brilliant MIT scientist, but he never believed that the PC can do the work of a mainframe computer. Despite his advisors, his management, just won't listen to anybody. He was in a denial. He was unwilling to change. Actually, put more money in supercomputers while everybody was going toward the PC revolution. Then unable to change was IBM. IBM had become so successful at a culture of its own process of its own, the chairman or the CEO made no difference. It's just elected process of seniority. They are not able to change the culture in time. It took an outsider to commit like Lou Bushman. Digital, of course, collapsed eventually. So to me, one of the biggest change transformation arises when they need to change it dramatically. Three forces bring about a change generally. One is technology, clearly. Technology is very transformative of the corporation. You need a leader to utilize the technology. Second one is globalization. I remember in my days consulting in Detroit for automotive, they were laughing at Japanese cars, small boxy cars, inexpensive, no air conditioning, no heater even in some cars. You know, these are Datsun 210, Toyota Corolla kind of a car, yeah. and today Japan take over the market. Toyota is like number one, GM is not there. So they were strictly in a denial state. So denial is a very major weakness of the corporation. Somebody has to come either from within or from outside to bring about a change. So it's situational in that regard that the company has become. So I have about seven habits. The second one is more interesting. More success you have, it's like a curse of incumbency. Awesome. Incumbent uh, are at a disadvantage. In technology, you can clearly see that too. The companies that are very well are scrambling to get into AI right now. Television, which is well established, one is trying to get into streaming services, cable, etc., are becoming streaming services. So technology is a very key driver. So situation arises from those three contexts: to globalization, technology, and changing demographics. Thank you, Dr. Shetsa. Uh, you mentioned the AI, and luckily, you know, you can't have a seminar these days without AI being spoken. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Dr. K. Sharad Babu, uh, Dr. Sir, uh, Sheikh Sir. Can you throw a light on how AI is impacting the marketplace and how Indian marketers need to react? This is a little bit of an out of syllabus question, <laughs> because, <laughs> but I think yeah, I think they don't want to miss an opinion from you. Uh, so over to you, sir. AI and marketing, I think, seems to be the question. Uh, AI will have marketing in places we had not anticipated, but it's obvious when you think about it. The biggest use of AI in marketing will be post-sales customer support. That will get more automated and more intelligent, which is the key dimensions of AI, more automation, more intelligence. So chatbots will be able to communicate as well as humans. And that's where you have so much, so many people involved whether those are call centers or messaging centers, et cetera. So we see that in the frontline post-sales customer support organization, which is a large part of the marketing thing, that will be one place. AI also will be very important in pre-sales activities. Most of the pre-sale is market research, getting understanding of the market. Uh, AI can do a lot cheaper than ever before and also maybe design of products. Through iteration, I can use AI technology to come out with better and better design, much faster, much cheaper. I mean, chat GPT, I'm amazed. I'm writing a new book about seven side effects of the internet age, negative side of the internet age, besides digital addiction. I have a title I know, 
but I needed a subtitle. And we are brainstorming and suddenly I said, let's just ask chat GPT. Within five seconds or 10 seconds came out six, seven names. My God. And one of them so great, better than any humans could design. So pre-sales activities also, it'll be very important. During so, sales activities, it has to be more an enabler, not a substitution. It'll be more an enabler. So how can I make the salesperson much smarter with AI technology? It's like a tool, uh, pretty much. Uh, like, I mean, to me, it's nothing mysterious. It is very similar to my days when I went to America. Most people were starting using calculator. Therefore, they could not count. Yes. I would, I would go to the grocery store and intentionally buy one bottle out of a pack of six to see if the checkout person would be able to calculate mentally. She, of course, cannot. Yeah. But she does not know how to do it. She forgot the art of learning, memorizing the tape we do, you know, for example. It's very amusing. It's the same thing is going to happen. So more smart the technology, the dumber we will, we more dependent we will become. So I think, sir, in, uh, in your answer, you seem to throw a little light on your next book. I do not know whether there are next books. But uh, I think you already have the contours of another book. So yeah. though you don't want to take the thunder out of the product, too many people should not know about it. But what is your labor of love now as far as a book publication is concerned? Uh, we, uh, the timing is not very good. Everything came together. It should be a separate timing, you know, uh, sequencing. So somehow it didn't work out. So this book came, this book on uh, India's road to transformation while leadership matters became went to front gate sooner because of the timing and then, the, and then everything that's happening in the world in 2024. So we speed up that one. Uh, the book on side effects of the technology has been like 10 years in the making oh. and it's getting put on by six more months and it's ready, but I cannot put my time on it. In between, my colleague and my former student, but my colleague, my at Emory University, she's an expert on pricing. Suddenly we realized pricing can be a great mechanism to serve the society. So we have a book called Purpose Driven Pricing. Pricing used by economists for maximizing revenues or profits or whatever financial outcomes, but not shaping markets. C.K. Prahlad did a fantastic job in his book, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, that he talked about affordability and accessibility. So we have taken, how do you make world-class products more affordable to the poor? And what can government can do to help out? Which governments do? Very fascinating book, but focus. Pricing is a very powerful weapon and a very instant weapon. I can change it instantly. Distribution is the hardest to change in marketing. And I can change, uh, uh, you know, advertising a little, little, but it still takes time. So, which is very fascinating. So that book now is in the second pipeline. Huh. But but I enjoy creating new knowledge, learning new knowledge, etc. That's what keeps me going even at this age. So I think uh, the questions have, I think the flood has slowed down. Uh, so maybe people are thinking about dinner here while you think of breakfast. Sir. <laughs> so I think... Uh, yeah, there's some more, is it? Yes. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, there's one that has come. So if you don't mind uh, a question, uh, can you suggest few key skill areas in practicing transformational leadership? So I presume we, all of us want to know how can we be incrementally more transformational in whatever we do. A question is from Dayala Ranjit. I mean, there are, three key points in transformation. One, you have to have the transformation leader, both an architect and a builder. Who is an architect? Architect is the one who imagines the future edifice, future temple, future church, future building, future corporate headquarters, whatever, this architect. But then somebody has to build it. And people who are good architects usually are not good builders. So you need both combinations in the leader. Leader is able to visualize where the future is like, he's able to articulate. The second thing is that he has an execution skill set. 
which is why I very much like Ram Charan's book on execution. You know, along with Basidi, he wrote a book, World Class. What matters is execution, not just imagination. You need imagination and you need execution under the same person or the office of the person, essentially. So that's clearly one. Second thing is that transformation requires change in processes. We do not give enough credit to processes. From the traditional processes to make a discontinuity, you cannot go back to the old ways. Then only transformation takes place, which is a change, which is what in India, this government has done very well. Everything is digital platform now. So we use of the digital yeah. the processes, the processes is a second major area. The third one, and probably as important, if not more, is internal marketing. You really have to go out on a road show among your employees in the company, wherever they are, all the way to the factory level people, frontline people, customer support people, to the senior executive communicating the message. You have to be the evangelical person. You have to evangelize the mission, mission values, culture, etc., to where you want to go. Without you talking, you cannot have some. You cannot have a video communication. You cannot have an email that articulate. You have to go in person. Very much like politicians have to be out with the masses, the voters. Here it is, the employees or something. Large enterprises today have half a million employees. Yeah. Fifty-six employees. It's huge amount of work in wire required. So I find fascinating that people tell me that we in the academic world are in the ivory tower. And I say, oh, no, no, we are not. We are touching students for ourselves. Physically, we go out and meet and talk. Ivory Tower is the chairman of the company who sits in his office. Everybody comes to him or her. Yeah. He's in a bubble. Yeah. Does not know the reality. So in one company, we actually made sure right. that the chairman of the company actually goes out one third of his time in front of customers and one third of his time in front of employees. Only one third he's allowed to be in the office. This used to be called by Peter Drucker, managing by wandering around. Yeah, MB, MBWA or something like that. <laughs> I think that's very important. It sounded like a great buzzword, but it's very much a reality. Because reality is so different from one factory to the other factory, from one country to the other country. In a globalizing economy, learning about local aspects and then synthesizing and putting it together so those are the three things I would recommend in terms of transformation. I think the audience is still uh, connected with your marketing persona. So it bring in a few questions. So if you don't mind, there's one. The name has not been mentioned. Is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs relevant to the current day millennial consumer behavior of, I suppose, millennials he has mentioned as centennials? And I don't know that, word, but I think the connection is with millennials and Maslow's hierarchy. Does it really work? Uh, I think so. It is the most favorite framework. I used to correspond with Abraham Maslow, which is the reason to be able to answer. I took his framework for individual growth, for individual change, to institutional change. So, for example. Religion as an institution, at the lower level, safety, survival, you have to mark it by saying, God will protect you. God loves you has no meaning. From calamity, disease, having a right child, etc., whatever it is. Once that need of safety, survival is satisfied by unions on the one hand, or by government providing a minimum security, uh, economic uh, survival, now you, you have to change where God loves you. Then that one love and affection is gone. Now we are driven by self-esteem and independence. I'll come to millenniums. In now you say God, God is with you because these guys want to be in charge. Millenniums don't like bosses. They don't like institutions telling what they do. Z generation is the same way now. Z, Z they we call it in India. So now you say, okay, you are empowered, but I enable you. So God is with you. 
which is at the self-esteem independence level. And the last one is God is in you, which is self-actualization. You are the God. Millenniums are accepting this much quickly because they started at a higher level in needs. They're not struggling poverty except for the refugees right now, pretty much. But they already started with a sort of a good, good, typical family, good security survival, etc. A lot of love and affection by the family members. So they are only starting at a self-esteem independence level. Unlike people like us who struggle quite a lot in our younger days, etc. I think that's the key. So it's very appropriate. Very, very appropriate to the millennial generation. There's one more thing that's happening in millennium generation, which again is interesting. They're very conscious of the environment. It comes from high school education and college education, sustainability. So they want to say, look, what can you do as a corporation that makes sense? I find fascinating young people don't want to work for companies which are not oriented toward some social cause. They must not harm the environment. They must be <laughs> all of those things are happening. So they are slightly different. It's not just my own salary and my career alone, but what the company is doing as an institution. My identity with the company may be not as nice if the company is not a good company, which is slightly different. That's what I sense with my students who are all a lot of undergraduates. <laughs> you talk to them, you get a different sense about who they are. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think there is a request from one of them whether the recording would be provided. I am just uh, passing it to the Ames uh, back office team. They'll take a call and maybe they will reply to you. I don't want to make a premature. Uh, on behalf of the audience, sir, I think uh, reading the book itself was fascinating. Uh, now, Hearing the author is a very rare occasion because mostly in life you don't get both. Uh, and uh, I think the questions, uh, I think people have been quite riveted on the conversation. Uh, and uh, they've asked, I think, fairly interesting and challenging questions. You were very kind to even answer questions which are out of scope. Uh, and your energy, your, uh, your vision is infectious. And... Uh, if you can do so much, when we think of ourselves, I can talk about myself, we do a fraction of what you're doing. And uh, I think that is the, uh, and age is no bar. I think that is another uh, great learning. And I, whenever we have listened to you, you have the same infectious energy. I'm sure the participants have also experienced that. And uh, I request uh, as many of the participants to buy this book uh, you know, keep it in the library, use it for the leadership programs. And I think uh, there is a lot of uh, difference in reading the book uh, and then deploying it. So, uh, Dr. Prasad, if there is anything more, uh, yeah, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah. Can I, can I yes. make one comment? And sure, sir. Over to you, over to you, sir. I want to thank several people. I want to thank you, first of all, for being such a great moderator raising questions and having the calmness <laughs> which is important you. Yeah. that calmness calms me down okay <laughs> which is very really <laughs> I want to thank Jan as I think uh, the director who they mentioned also yeah. Jan is my colleague in India and does behind the scene a lot of work but most importantly I want to thank my publisher vibrant publisher is a niche publisher company more specialized topics, but uh, but he's a brilliant young man. And uh, he did in a crisis because I knew my colleague's health was deteriorating and right. I wanted him to done. Big publishers were unwilling to do help anyway. And uh, and then and, 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 and Deep Udeshi stepped up. He has done such a large amount of work so quickly, I can't believe. So I want to thank him, his staff people who are equally very good I just wanted to acknowledge, without him any support, the book would not have come out for a long time. So thank you, Deep. And of course, AIMS as an organization always is, we, we, I always, I want to do things for AIMS anyhow, I've done that before. Jank is involved heavily with AIMS along with the 
So anyway, I can help things. That's fine. So thanks. Thanks for hosting me. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, wish you a great day ahead and great months and years ahead. And we are already looking forward to seeing you soon uh, at some platform. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and for your wisdom and your perspectives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Prasad will uh, express a, my colleague will uh, express a formal vote of thanks. Over to you, Prasad. Yeah. Uh, Jagdish Head, sir, we are really amazed and privileged to have, you know, words from you, words of your wisdom. And really, like uh, Professor Vijayan sir is saying, that an author coming to the audience and explaining the thought problem is an amazing experience for all the participants. In fact, we school and AIMS, both of us are indebted to you, sir for accepting the invitation and also making these uh, thoughts available. And I'm sure most of the institutions will procure the book, even for library, and also sharing it with other faculty members. I'm really uh, grateful to the AIM Secretariat, our uh, president, Professor uh, Mr. Sudhir Sharmaji, and illustrious past presidents, executive board members, and faculty across various institutions in the country and some of them may be from abroad because uh, the live sessions is going on uh, from YouTube as well as the Zoom session. And we are really privileged and we are all grateful to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yes, bye-bye.